Welcome to our lecture online. In response to a lot of requests, viewers have asked us, can you do some JEE main types of questions? And we thought, well, that's probably a good idea. So we looked at some of the past tests and yeah, there's some very interesting problems there. So let's go ahead and make some JEE main exam uh, questions, uh, videos on those questions. So you can see how those questions look like and in case you want to prepare for the test, hopefully this will help. Of course, it's going to take a while before we build up a number of these examples on these videos. It takes time to make the videos. But here's number one. And you'll find that the JE main questions in general are somewhat easier or maybe less difficult than the JE advanced, but there's still some very challenging questions in there. And you'll see that as we progress through the various examples. So here we have our first one. It's a mechanics question. It deals with circular motion. So let's read the question. Four identical particles of equal masses, one kilogram, made to move along the circumference of a circle of radius one meter under the action of their own mutual gravitational attraction. The speed of each particle will be, and they give us four choices. Hmm. So, what I found was with the JE main type of questions, you need to zero in, and probably with the JE advanced as well, but with the JE main, you need to zero in exactly on what the concept is. So we're always going to look for the, what is the concept here, because that will help us figure out quickly how to do the problem. Before we come up with the concept, let's make a little diagram. It always helps to make a visual diagram of what's happening. So we have four equal particles of equal mass traveling around a circular path. And let's assume here that they're equal distance because they would be repelling each other with the same amount of force, or at least not repelling, in this case, attracting each other because uh, they're not charges, they're masses. Each has the same mass. So there would be an equal amount of attraction which would cause the four particles to be equal distance from one another. Now, to try and figure out, well, why would they be moving in the first place? If we simply put four particles there, nothing is going to move. So once they're giving some velocity, at what velocity would they be going around in a circle due to their own gravitational attraction? And the idea is that if you take a look at one of the particles, let's say this one right here, you can see that there's going to be a force of attraction towards this particle right here, a force of attraction towards this particle, and a force of attraction towards this particle. And then, of course, if you think about it, if you take a look at the force of attraction here, there will be a component this way and a component in this direction. Same with this force right here. There would be a component in this direction and a component in this direction. These two would cancel each other out, so those components are gone. That means that these are the three components of the force that would be pulling on this particle due to the presence of the other three. Which means we seem to have a centripetal force acting on this particle, you, of course you would have the same on this particle, the same on this particle, the same on this particle, and so the motion would be due to the centripetal force. And so now you can think of the concept. The concept we're dealing with here is centripetal motion. So we're dealing with motion around the circle due to the centripetal force. And then we can think of it this way, we know that the centripetal force must be equal to mv squared over r. And now we have a relationship between the velocity of the particles and the centripetal force. And of course, since mass is equal to one kilogram and the radius is equal to one meter, those would cancel out. And so when we take the square root of both sides, we have velocity is equal to the square root of the centripetal force acting on any one of the particles. And all we have to do then is calculate the centripetal force, simply calculate these three components, add them together, and that, take the square root of that, and that will give us the velocity. So that would be the concept and the strategy, because usually with a concept, you end up with the strategy of how to solve the problem. So let's go ahead and find out the centripetal force. So here, let's call it FC1, uh, and let's call this here FC2, this component right here. Of course, we have two of them, so we can simply find one and double the amount to get for both. 
All right, so the centripetal force to one is going to be a gravitational force, which is equal to g, the gravitational constant, times the product of their masses, which is m times m, or m squared, divided by the distance between them squared. Now, the distance between them squared, that would be 2r squared, so it would be 2r quantity squared. And of course, m is 1 and r is 1, so m and r cancel out. So this would be equal to g squared, oh, not g uh, squared, but simply g, because the square is on the m. And 2 squared would be 4. So g over 4 would be the centripetal force between this, would be the centripetal force caused by the gravitational attraction between these two. All right. Now we need to find, let's say, Fc2. So Fc2 would be equal to this one right here. So now, how, what do we call this? Let's call this just Fc3, just to give it some, uh, some notation. So Fc2 is equal to Fc3 times, now notice that if you draw a triangle this way, this way, and this way, notice that this would be r, this would be r, and this distance right here would be the square root of 2 times r, that would be the hypotenuse, the distance between these two. And since r is 1, the distance would simply be the square root of 2. And notice that would cause this to be a 45 degree angle. So that means that Fc2 would be Fc3 times a cosine of 45 degrees. Okay? So now Fc3 is simply again g times the product of their masses, m squared, divided by the distance between them squared, that would be the square root of 2r, quantity squared, and then we multiply times the cosine of 45 degrees, which is the square root of 2 over 2. Notice that m and r will cancel again because they're equal to 1. We have the square root of 2 squared, that's 2, times 2 is 4, times the square root of 2, times g. So this would be uh, g, times the square root of 2 over 4. And that would be one of the two components of Fc2, but now, of course, there's two of them. So 2 times Fc2 would be equal to twice this number, which would be 2 times g squared of 2 over 4, which is simply equal to g squared of 2 over 2. So now we have the two components, Fc2 and Fc2. There's two of them, right? So we have two of those, plus Fc1, which was over here. Now all we have to do is add them together and take the square root. So now we know that V is equal to the square root of the centripetal force, which is equal to the square root of the sum of those two. So it would be Fc1 plus 2 times Fc2. So in this case, that's equal to the square root of, uh, where were we, g over 4, g over 4 plus g times the square root of 2 over 2. Hmm. So we can factor out a g, so this is equal to the square root of g times, and here we have 1 over 4 plus the square root of 2 over 2. So now we have to simplify that. And notice when we take the common denominator, we have this is equal to the square root of g times 1 over 4, multiplied top and bottom by 2, we get plus 2 times the square root of 2 over 4. And then notice we can factor out a 1, uh, 1 over 4, the square root of that, that gives us 1 half, so this is 1 half times the square root of g times 1 plus 2 times the square root of 2. And so that would be equal to the velocity of the particles due to their centripetal motion. Now, do we have one of those answers up there? And notice the very first one looks like it's correct. So in this case, A is the correct answer in this case. So again, we take a look. We have four particles. They're acting on each other through a gravitational force, the mutual gravitational force. Because of that, they're feeling the same force in all directions, which would place them equidistant from one another. The radius is one meter. The masses are one kilogram. So r and m turn equal to 1. The concept is the centripetal motion, which says that the centripetal force equals mv squared of r, so we have centripetal acceleration essentially, and that means since m and r are equal to 1, v equals the square root of the centripetal force. To find the centripetal force, we need to find centripetal force 1 between these two, 
and then the force between these two, but then we have to multiply times the cosine of 45 degrees because these two can, uh, components cancel out. Since we have two of them, we end up with two times the centripetal force, one and two, and we know that each one was g times the square root of two over four, which gives us the total for both of them to be g squared of two over two. Add it all together, and that will then give us the velocity, and that is how it's done. They get five minutes for each problem? I think they get three minutes for each problem. So this one you have to work fast. You could potentially do it in three minutes, but you would be hard pressed to get it done in three minutes. Yeah. So this problem, the L, will work for a planet or marbles? Marbles, planets, any object, of course, in order for it to work, you have to all give them the exact velocity required, and then there'd be no friction at all. So if there's no friction, they would indeed keep going. In other words, once the proper velocity was given, the motion would be continuous forever if there was no slowdown for any reason, no friction or anything like that. Of course, there's no system in the universe that is like that. There's always some other force that would change it and things would, um, of course, get messed up. But yeah, purely theoretical problem. It's a very interesting one.